Kevin Bowen here. Don't forget to listen to the the fan now on 93.5 or 107.5 FM. And check out our latest coverage online at 107.5thefan.com. I don't know about you guys. Whenever I get to mid-April, I'm like, yes, yes. All of this draft talk, all of this chatter, breaking down scenarios. Really, over the past several months and, you know, when the team you cover finishes under 500, the draft chatter typically starts a little bit later um, into the previous year. Um, and now we're finally going to get some answers on it. So uh, I'm super excited for the next couple of weeks. Uh, like I mentioned, we will have a virtual Beers with Bowen. That is 8 o'clock Thursday night. I've had a lot of you DM me from out of town. Um, expressing you know a ton of interest and in finally being able to to attend and uh, we will have yes Joey Molinero will be joining us um, so I'm really really pumped and, and excited that um, he has agreed to do that and uh, him and I will be on YouTube around eight o'clock on Thursday night obviously it's free it's just a live stream via YouTube and um, for those of you that have been to prior beers with Bowens it'll be fairly similar. Um, I, th- I think we've hopefully kind of fine-tuned a few things. Uh, we'll try and take some questions off of kind of YouTube comments or even even Twitter throughout the night. Uh, but there will definitely be some content that that I don't um, you know give on the um, on the podcast. We, we'll still have a podcast uh, next week as well. Uh, one final one before the draft, and on that pod, I will probably hit on my own mock draft. You know, get into one for the Colts as they currently have seven draft picks. Here in 2020, which is not a lot for Chris Ballard. Now, obviously, we know he's not afraid to wheel and deal, particularly backwards, to acquire more draft capital. So we'll see if that takes place next Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So again, beers with Bowen presented by White Claw. You know, during this quarantine, you know, you can only throw back so many beers. Sometimes you got to throw, throw throw back the White Claw or two to uh, watch the figure. So uh, really happy to have them on board with us and then uh like i said having joey um take some time out of an already busy schedule for him we greatly greatly appreciate that it'll be fun to get back together with him so today's pod um we'll hit obviously a a a good amount on the draft that will be the heavy heavy focus um twitter questions i had a lot get sent in i didn't ask for any because so many of you um, I've just started to kind of send in questions throughout the week, which is great. Um, I just compile a list, and um, we'll get to those in the back half of the podcast. What I do want to start out with, and this will be kind of the, the main course, if you will, of this edition of Kevin's Corner, is a positional mock draft. And for those of you that have loyal listeners of this podcast, you'll know full well this is kind of an annual tradition we do um, mid-April, really, every year. And it is a little bit different this year that Chris Ballard enters a draft without a first-round pick. But for the most part, the needs are still the needs. And like I said, the Colts have seven draft picks, and I will assign a position to each of those seven draft picks based off how, how important I consider those needs to be. As we are really through the meat of the free agency period, I mean, I, I'm recording this on Tuesday morning, April 14th. So what? I mean, we're, we're nearly a month. Um, into the new league year. And while I do think this offseason is a little bit different, you know, most years, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a single free agent that Chris Ballard has let sit on the open market for a month and then brought back. Now, why I say this is a little bit of an odd year, it's because of everything that's happening from um, an off-season program standpoint, and that it is going to be virtual. I mean, there is a possibility that these players never get together in person in their, you know, NFL cities uh, during the eight or nine week off-season program. So, if that's the case, you know, do you see some of these veterans of you know, Jonathan Williams or Jabal Sheard or Clayton Gathers or, um, you know, whoever else you want to throw on that list that is on the open market still? Do they possibly come back? Because you're looking for familiarity, um, and maybe that is something that we do see. Right now, I think the Colts have 72 guys on their um, 90-man roster. I believe that's right, after the Rosie Nick signing, which, God, God bless fullbacks. I freaking love fullbacks. We'll get into that dur- uh, during Twitter questions. But, um, yeah, I think so. 
72, that would leave room for, what, seven draft picks currently that you have, and then 11 undrafted free agents, and that would be a 90-man roster. And something that we have seen, certainly from Chris Boward in prior years, is even when that draft comes around, just because as we sit here right now, there's 18 you know, open spots on that 90-man roster, seven draft picks, like we said, and then you know, possibly 11 free agents. We've often seen him sign more than the what it looks like on paper number for undrafted free agents, and then he's just cut some of the back end of back end of the roster guys. So I posted a depth chart to 1075thefan.com. Check that out if you if you haven't. Um, gosh, I will say that I had a. Um, I don't know if I've ever had this I, honestly. But last night, getting ready to do the uh, do the dishes, and um, you know, usually I, whatever I do, half the dishes, take a break, uh, you know, try to entertain myself with Twitter. I'm like, oh wow, uh, that's kind of a long DM from someone. I had a player wife, yeah, player wife, uh, chirping a little bit about um, she wasn't too pleased where her uh, where her husband was on the depth chart, so. Uh, and, and folks, she didn't, she didn't hold back. I mean, it was, uh, she was breaking down every person above him on the depth chart. And, um, she was like, he should be above him because of this. And he, he should be above that guy because of this. And I'm like, wow. I mean, you, I know the quarantine has people doing crazy things, but I mean, April 13th depth, depth charts. I, I don't know if that's, that's a reason to be sliding into the DMS of a, um, of a beat reporter, but you know what? I appreciate the follow, and I more importantly, I, I appreciate the click. So, um, so I told her thank you, and um, hopefully, she had a, a good a good rest of her night. So, uh, l- let's hop into a positional mock draft for the Colts, and obviously, round two, pick thirty four, is where the draft currently will begin for Chris Bowden and company. And I, I, I'm going to stick with quarterback um, at that spot. I know it's not the most immediate need in 2020, but it is the biggest need when you talk about the long-term future of this football team. Um, you know, we've talked about it endlessly of Philip Rivers, Kobe Brissett, Chad Kelly, all of them, you know, under contract just through this season. No one is under contract past 2020. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's the stat that we, we, we've mentioned, you know, the Colts haven't taken a quarterback since Chandler Harnish, Mr. Irrelevant. The pride of Norwell, I believe. Uh, Northern Illinois' finest. Great guy, Chandler Harnish. Um, with the last pick in, in 2012, the same draft, obviously, as Andrew Luck. So uh, I just think it's wise. I, I, I think it's smart. I'm not saying that pick 34 is your franchise quarterback by any means. Um, in a dream scenario, it's you know Derek Carr or Jimmy Garoppolo. or I'm trying to think of other kind of second, third, fourth round picks, Russell Wilson, you know, Kirk Cousins, you know, again, in an ideal scenario, they can become a starter for you. Um, If not, they can be a backup, which is still equally as important, uh, I think, to the Colts, honestly, because we see how much they have invested in Jacoby Brissett and, you know, clearly feel like his cap hit is worthy of him, you know, being the backup quarterback. So, again, I think from that standpoint, it still gives you, some role uh, moving into 2021 and beyond if, you know, the Philip River situation, which I did see, we got a question on that um, in Twitter questions, which I think is a good question, just on how long is this marriage going to be between Philip Rivers and the Colts? All right, pick number two, that's 44 overall. Um, this is the Colts' normal second round pick here in 2020. Uh, I will go with wide out. This is the most pressing immediate need here in 2020. And look, I, everyone tells me, great depth, blah, you know, this and that. You can find a starter in the fourth round, fifth round, blah, blah, blah. I don't really give a shit, honestly. You need instant impact. You need instant impact. And I'm not waiting much deeper in the draft than this um, to be taken a wide receiver. You you need, for the Colts, in my opinion, for the Colts to be a definite playoff team in 2020, they need to find success out of the second round wideout, a la Tennessee with AJ Brown, you know Seattle with DK Metcalf, San Francisco with Debo Samuel, you know like those types of of immediate, you know really first day or certainly rookie season um, guys that were able to be counted on for you. I think that's an absolute must. 
You know, if I'm going to get nitpicky, you guys know full well, you know, the, the type of body that I want at that receiver position. And we'll get into some names. That will be kind of the bulk of next week's podcast. Um, I, I've got a list of, I will give you my own mock draft, but then I also have a list of probably an additional, you know, three to four guys at each position that, uh, that I definitely have my eye on for the Colts. But, you know, if you go quarterback wide out there in that second round, I, I don't think you're going to get, you know, people too, too frustrated um, with that haul. And that seems to be, you know, I posted a mock draft look on Monday to 1075thefan.com. And that really seems to be the trend. You know, I, I looked at five mock drafts, and, and of, of those two second round picks, all 10 of them were offensive skill quarterback, running back, wide out, or tight end. And I don't disagree with that, honestly. All right, round three, 75 overall. I'm going tight end. I know it's not great depth in this draft class, but um, I, I think tapping into it early would be wise. You know, Frank Reich obviously uses a whole lot of multiple tight end personnel, and um, I just think having a bigger kind of red zone threat, you know, more of that vertical guy, um, you know, think of, again, what the skill set was for Ebron. I'm a big fan of, you know, diversifying your offensive skill sets. And that is at receiver, that is at running back, and that is at tight end. And so I'm not looking for the inline blocker. No, I'm looking for, you know, even kind of that hybrid. You know, I know a lot of people have clamored for Chase Claypool, and he's pretty adamant that he wants to be a receiver, or feels like he will be a receiver at the next level. But again, you know, something more in the Ebron type of body type mold is what I would be looking for in this tight end. Jack Doyle, re-signed. And um, he turns 30 years old next month. He's resigned, I think, a three-year extension. Um, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of the guarantees do fall in that first year. Mo Ali Cox back for just a one season. So when you get into these numbers, uh, you know, you don't ha- I mean, if you look at, like, the pass catcher group, wide out, tight end. Honestly, I think Paris Campbell and Jack Doyle are the only ones under contract of notable names under contract past 2020. You know, you're going to have to make a decision on Hilton. Mo Ali Cox, this is such a big year for him. And just, okay, are you Eric Swope or is there something more there? Um, you know, Zach, Zach Paschal, honestly. Um, really, really solid job he's done for this football team the last two years. Okay, is he a legit, like, two or three in the league? Or was he just kind of forced into duty last season? I think those are questions that you have. Uh, but I, I would be taking a tight end here in round three. And it's not something that I'm like really at the forefront of my mind. But to me, it is a nice bonus of I'm going receiver here in the second round. I'm going tight end in the third round. I'm, you know, just go ahead and show my cards. I'm going to take another receiver here in a, in a couple of rounds for whoever that young quarterback is that eventually – is the franchise guy moving forward? I want to have some young skill in the building. Um, you know, clearly that was a, a, a big, a big objective for Ryan Gregson, and it worked out. You know, early on, Andrew Luck having the T.Y. Hiltons and um, and what Dwayne Allen and Kobe Fleener as well. You know, early in that in that 2012 draft. All right, let's go into round four, pick 122. I am drafting. An offensive lineman, and specifically, I'm drafting an offensive tackle. Um, you know, if I really look deep into that depth chart, and again, that's posted up on 1075thefan.com. If I'm going to nitpick, I probably feel a little bit better about the interior of that group than the, I guess we've never called it the exterior of that group, but but the outside positions, tackle. Um which to some might be a little bit weird, but there are a couple names in that interior that you actually are like, okay, in a pinch, if they do pan out, it's not the end of the world. And I guess I just feel like this is in general, the Colts, how they've invested their resources into their offensive line certainly doesn't speak to it, but um, because they've invested two first round picks in the interior of that unit. I think in general, it's easier to find interior offensive linemen than it is to find tackles. 
So uh, you, you guys know full well. You guys have listened to this podcast a whole lot. Um, you know where I sit on the offensive line depth and you know comparing it to other teams around the league and how fortunate the Colts were last season. So just because, you know, to some people, you know, spending a third round pick, fourth round pick, they might think, oh, that guy could potentially come in and start from day one. This pick isn't going to do that. But you're one injury away from this guy playing a huge, huge role, and I think you need depth, and I'm good with grooming someone for whenever Anthony Costanzo decides enough is enough. And I know he re-signed a two-year deal, and, he gave every inkling that he thinks he could play maybe past that two-year deal. But when a guy starts thinking about retirement, you cover your ass. And you aren't just covering it for, again, this pick is not Costanzo retirement related. Is that one of five factors that play into this pick for me? Yes. But it's not probably one of the top two or three. To me, it's having depth and grooming a tackle, which is difficult to find. Because who knows if Brain Smith gets hurt. Costanzo gets hurt, you know, whatever happens up front, um, it's just a luxury that you that you need to have. All right, uh, second pick on day three, round five, pick number 160. We are going back into the receiver position. Um, we know this is draft number four for Chris Ballard. I added it up the other day, 29 picks total for Chris Ballard so far in three years. He has taken a receiver before round five just once. And that's Paris Campbell. So uh, this would be a little bit out of the ordinary for him. But, you know, we saw it, you know, a a few years ago with Reese Fountain and Deion Kane. And I just look at this pick and and, and think you want the high-end quality at receiver, which is why I went second round. But you also want just general depth. Because when I look at the depth chart, I consider three locks to make this football team at receiver. Hilton, Campbell, and Pascal. Um, Reese Fountain is probably that number fourth guy right now. Ashton Doolin would be, I think, right there with him as well. But you just, what if Reese Fountain doesn't pan out? You know? I mean, Deion Kane didn't pan out. And like I've said before, Deion Kane, you know, from a physical limitation standpoint, the ACL was fine last season. And he had a much more of a proven resume in college than Reese Fountain did. So uh, I just don't think we could sit there and be like, oh, you got Reese Fountain, you're good. No, I, I, don't, I don't want to put that type of pressure on him. He's coming back from a very serious injury and has never caught a pass in the NFL, let alone played really a meaningful snap. You know, he dropped that ball in the playoff game in Kansas City, and I think he was in for some kneel downs. I mean, it's not like he has been on the field for any sort of meaningful football and didn't even play last year. Um, was it at all in the preseason? He maybe played that first game in uh, in Buffalo, but still, I, I just don't want to uh, put all my eggs into that basket. So I am taking two receivers here in the first five rounds. Moving into round six, the Colts will pick twice here in a uh, handful of picks. We'll start with 193. I am going with my first defensive player in the draft, which probably makes Chris Ballard just... <laughs> but... Um, Whatever. Uh, I'm going with I'm going with the defensive back. More so a safety. I could be talked into two different skill sets. I could be talked into the hybrid safety that could play corner, uh, but kind of flip the Marvell Tell thing. So last year you drafted Tell, who was a safety that you wanted to play corner. I would like to see a guy that you want to play at safety – but has some corner background. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking at there. You only have four safeties on your roster, like total. Uh, that is Hooker, Kari Willis, George Odom, and Roland Milligan. So, I mean, four guys that have been on your 53-man roster before, obviously, um, and, and have played varying roles for you. But I, I just think you want one, one more body there. Now, the other skill set that I could probably be talked into is do you want more of that power, you know, hammer safety in what you're losing in, in uh, Clayton Gathers. So again, I think there's a couple ways you could go here at, at safety. Um, but that to me, as I look at the defensive group, the, the secondary, I think could use just one more number. 
And I'll, obviously, it's always a group that you know you can kind of tap into on special teams. All right, lastly, pick 197 in round six. I think this came from Miami. One of these picks came from the Evan Baim trade with Miami. We're going running back. I'm always a fan. You guys know it. Always a fan of drafting running back. And right now, you know, you're a month into free agency. Jonathan Williams, we'll see how that plays out, but he's no longer on your roster. And I think Jonathan Williams is a guy that looks at this depth chart and saw it, you know, firsthand last year where I mean, he rushes for what? Back-to-back 100-yard games. I want to say he had like two care like he had like six or seven carries the next week and then he touched the ball twice. He maybe only got on the field two plays the rest of the season. Let me um let me look that up real quick. Um and, and I know like on paper, okay, he's your fourth running back, like fourth running back, it's just kind of like, okay, you don't really need that. But he's really the number three running back. Or he was, because you know, Naeem Hines is just that gadget guy. Yeah, okay, Williams goes, you know, 100 yards against Jacksonville, 100 yards against Houston right there in mid-November. He plays 16 snaps the next week against the Titans, and then he plays two. Dos Minutos offensive snaps the last four weeks of the season. Jeez. Um, So, yeah, that's not great. Um, so does he look at it and say, all right, you know, if I can find a better situation somewhere, I want to go that route. Um, so right now you've got Marlon Mack, you've got Naeem Hines, you've got Jordan Wilkins. But again, if an injury happens to Mack, you know, Hines is the gadget guy. You need somebody else to support Wilkins. And Wilkins has has been a little bit banged up at various times in his career. So let's go running back there around six to round it out. So, uh, Again, to go over that, that is quarterback, wideout, tight end, offensive tackle, receiver again, safety, hybrid kind of DB, and then running back. That is six of your seven picks on the offensive side of the ball. (laughs) Boy, I can't see Chris Bauer going there. I can't. I cannot at all. Well, you've just been so defensive heavy. I mean, in free agency, you made four moves on defense. Um. Look at past draft picks. Of your last 12 draft picks, 10 are defensive players. And really, of your two offensive guys, only one's here. That's Paris Campbell. Jackson Barton, seventh-round pick at Kansas City. Um, I guess you had Javon Patterson, but again, you know, he – he tore his ACL last year. So, you know, when you look at the last whatever, you know, you go back to the end of that 2018 draft when you spent you know, linebacker, linebacker on Zaire Franklin and uh, and Matthew Adams, it's been a heavy defensive run. And, you know, two seventh-round picks on the offensive line is not a whole lot of draft capital. So uh, that's why I go so offensive heavy in this draft. All right, that is the positional mock draft. It is time for Twitter questions. Um, again, got a lot here. Got a whole, whole lot of, um, of Twitter questions that we'll dive into. Let me make one quick little change here. Um, All right, let's dive into them. We will start with Tyler. Oh, yeah, I forgot about this. He's got to have to ask the uh, jersey question. Uh, Kevin, first off, love the pod. Thanks for keeping up the content. In regards to the new uniforms the Colts have mentioned, how drastic will the changes be, and have you heard any rumors? Well, obviously, Tyler sent this in before. Um, we saw the jersey release. Was it a jersey release? I guess more of a color palette, word mark release, logo release, I guess, um, on Monday. And I cannot, I mean, people are freaking fired up about jerseys. Joey Molinero loves jerseys. Loves them. Um, he just loves jerseys in general. I don't know how much he loves these Colts jerseys. I guess we'll ask him on Thursday. But, uh, yeah, I mean, people were, I mean, you talk about drawing lines in the sand, and my mentions were just, whoo, hostile, quarantine hostile. I kind of like the, the wife of that, uh, 
that Colts player hostile. Um, okay. I mean, really pretty subtle to me. I actually like the logo. I do, but I am a, such a sucker as a native of the state of Indiana. I am such a stu- sucker for involving the state of Indiana into a logo. Now, this podcast is certainly across the United States and very global and none of you or the vast majority of you don't care, which whatever, it's fine. But I kind of always been like, you know what? You have training camp at Terre Haute. You have training camp at Anderson. Hell, 90% of your football team probably lives in the suburbs or your coaching staff. Like it's more than just Indianapolis. And I'm talking as a person that's lived in Indianapolis for the last, you know, 10 years. So, um, I like I like using the state. I had my brother text me saying that the logo looks like a saltine cracker. Kind of does. I love saltine crackers, especially when I was younger. A little peanut butter on that. Mm. Solid quarantine snack. Uh, the word block. I, I was just kind of meh. You know, I'm pretty indifferent. And like again, everyone wants me to have these just scorching hot takes, and I'm just kind of like. They're subtle. I don't really – what I do love, I love the black alternate color. Give me a black alternate uniform and give it to me this season in one football game. You know, everyone's like, the Colts have the most tradition-rich jerseys in the NFL. They can never change. Stop. They can have an alternate uniform for one game. One football game. Liven it up. Reach a different demographic. Reach a younger audience. Do something a little bit differently. Appease the players in that locker room. You know full well they're probably all about kind of that, all right, let's get a little bit more of that black and little tough-minded. Um, you know, I saw kind of a script for a little bit of a design for a black uniform. I think it looks good. So, um, again, pretty subtle to me. I guess will the end zone have to change, you know, how it looks? Colts, Indianapolis in there. Um We'll see how that is. I did have – I saw it looks like the Colts, um, I, for the for lack of a better term, uh, stole that logo from uh, from um, Cathedral High School. Yeah, I, I had a couple, uh, couple Cathedral people chirping at me and saying, look, this is our Cathedral football logo. They just ripped it right off there, and we've tagged Jack Doyle in, in post, and we've tagged the Colts in post, and we know they saw it. And I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. Cathedral versus the Colts. Who's going to win that court appeal here? But yeah, I mean, come on now. Cathedral already gave you Jack Doyle. You really need to take our logo too? Come on now. All right, Tony chimes in. KB, podcast request. Rank your preferences. Michael Pittman, Chase Claypool, T. Higgins. <whistles> Honestly, probably in that order. It's close though, really. I mean, you guys know how much I love Chase Claypool. Um, but I would maybe just go slight edge to Pittman. I think Pittman is more of a fine-tuned receiver at this point than Claypool. Claypool, there's a little bit of a rawness that you got to develop as a wideout. But I think he can help you out immediately from a 50-50 ball, back shoulder, red zone, those sorts of things. And then definitely can help you out on special teams. But again, Pittman is probably more of your more of your better wideout. But um, all those guys, I could probably be talked into. All right, Juan Pablo chimes in. Hey, Kevin, hope you're well and safe. One good thing about this situation is I'll be able to attend beers with Bowen from Columbia. God, I love that. He's already registered and can't wait. Um, has a question for the podcast. Here we go. Let's say Ballard selects a quarterback like Love or Eason or whoever. If Rivers has a great season and goes deep in the playoffs and the new QB shows good development, do they go with the new QB after one year of seasoning or do they extend a proven QB like Rivers already with the one year keep up the great work and stay safe uh you do the same one as well and, and all of our listeners out there of kevin's corner um wow that is a great question i think the key phrase that i keep looking at there is deep playoff run okay that means at least divisional to some people it means championship game if that's the case i, I would assume philip rivers looks like a pro bowl quarterback and that the change of scenery and the environment's good and that, you know, you've tapped into a higher level uh, play at the most important position in sports. I, I, 
you know, how does that young quarterback show good development without playing? That that to me is 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 difficult to weigh. And you know, I keep on hearing Frank Reich. You know, when he talks about Philip Rivers, he makes sure to mention one or two years. Just because the contract is one year, uh, they are not afraid to mention two. But the biggest if is if Rivers plays well. So I think based on your scenario, I think they would roll with Rivers for another year. Because again, as we sit here right now, unless it's, I mean, love and you just see crazy development and you feel like it's, you know, Patrick Mahomes, Alex Smith sort of situation, I'm not sure you see enough from the young quarterback that theoretically would be a second round pick, I assume, that you see enough from that guy that is going to say, Hey, Philip Rivers, you just led us to, again, whatever, the AFC title game. But we want you to, whatever, hang it up, or we're not giving you $25 million again. I don't know. I, I just I can't see that happening. But, you know, I think we got to forget, you know, Mahomes was a, top, he was a 10 overall pick. Like, there was something there that maybe the Colts aren't getting at 34 overall. All right, Drew, if the Colts do decide to move on from Venetary, who replaces them on the side of Lucas Oil? Is Buckner a banner player already, or is that earned? Boy, another debate. I'd love to have Joey Molinaro in here for. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't think you can put Buckner on there right away. I don't. And I guess I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here, but I think your quarterback just goes on there. I'm sorry. I know he's he's a one-year guy, and Buckner's a one-year guy. and um, But I, I just think your quarterback has to go on there. That's just I, I think it's like a prerequisite in the city of Indianapolis that your quarterback has to go on there. I know Jacoby Brissett didn't go on there, but um, that was um, just kind of crazy. So, yeah, put Rivers on there. Put Obviously put Hilton. Leave Hilton on there, I should say. And then um, got to go through all pros. Leonard Nelson, which honestly seems pretty easy to me. Hilton, Leonard, Nelson are locks. And I'd probably go with Rivers over Buckner. Get your defensive flavor in there. Get some young guys in there. Yeah, that's what I'd do. I, honestly, I'd put Rosie, Rosie Nix on there. Put a fullback on there. Show what you're about. Know when fans drive by and they're going to the airport or a visiting team drives in, we have a fullback on the side of our stadium. <laughs> Freaking love it. Love it. I don't know if Rosie Nix is going to make the football team, but damn, I love a fullback. All right, Andrew, as a Bengals fan, is there any scenario where you can imagine the Colts trading 34 and 44 for 33? How does the board have to fall? Boy, if the Colts are trading 34 and 44 for 33, I got to check Chris Ballard's pulse. I mean, I got to look up the trade value on what, what that would actually mean. You know, quarterback would be the only, only reason. And if Jordan Love starts falling, you're just trading into the back end of the first round. You've got teams in the back end of the first round that want to move back. San Francisco, honestly, tra- trade with them again. They don't pick after the first round until round five. So move up to 31, get the fifth-year deal on love, and boom, you give them whatever, 34 and, I don't know, a, a fourth, a third, something like that. All right, trade value chart. If you were to move one spot up, okay, so if you were to move up from 34 to 33, that's worthy of a six-round pick, not a middle-of-the-second-round pick. So, yeah, I mean, boy, I can't, I, I cannot see that at all. All right, Craig, um, Craig chimes in. Hey, Kevin, two quick draft questions for the pod. I know Rivers does well with big body wideouts. Since Rivers is on a one-year contract, how much will they take his fit into account versus long-term fit when looking at wideout? Second, if the Colts were to draft a QB this year, do you favor a big QB like Eason or a more shifty quarterback like Jalen Hurts? Two really good questions. Okay, let's start with the first. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier about a wideout. Yes, I've mentioned, clearly I've mentioned, and I'm going to post something this afternoon to 1075thefan.com where I dive deeper into this big body wideout need for the Colts. I just think it's good to diversify your skill groups. I think you are a harder receiver bunch to defend if you have 4-3-1-40 in Campbell, a all-around speed guy for sure in Hilton, and then now you're throwing in 
boom, Michael Pittman, boom, Chase Claypool, T. Higg- whoever. I just think that makes you harder to defend. I don't care who your quarterback is. And I think it's an element to this offense and to this franchise we just haven't seen enough of. 50-50 QBs, or excuse me, 50-50 wideouts. Make those plays. High point balls. Come down with things. Like, go back. <laughs> the Colts tweeted out a video, and I will put this at the bottom of my big body wideout um, article later today, but the Colts tweeted out a video of Philip Rivers' highlights from last season. Whatever, top 10 plays that Philip Rivers had. And literally, the highlight reel is Mike Williams just mossing everybody. That, that's what the highlight reel is. It is the, the kid in the backyard that has hit puberty more than, quicker than anyone else, and you're just throwing lobs up to him, and he is just abusing his little brother. I mean, that's, it's like, oh, yeah, Mike Williams with a top 10 pick. <laughs> that's literally what the highlight reel was. I mean, certainly Rivers puts the ball on target and makes some, some good throws, but damn. I don't care who's under center. Big body wide out, I want. Uh, look, I know that you're not getting Mike Williams, but and then your second question, I am, I'm a little torn on this. What do you want in your in your backup quarterback? I, I don't love Hurts, Eason, you know, from enough to be like, oh my gosh, that guy is your future, um, you know, whatever future franchise quarterback, but. I guess I'm a little bit torn on what you want from that skill set. Do you want like the mobile quarterback that can be a gadget player week in and week out? But then if all of a sudden Philip Rivers, you know, gets severely hurt that your mobile backup quarterback, you've got to change some of your offense for. That's not great. Or do you want the bigger statue, which you don't, play at all from a week to week standpoint, but then when you, you know, do get into, okay, you need him for multiple weeks. Maybe you're not changing your offense as much. I like more of the mobile, but again, you guys know that I'm more of an aggressive minded person. Um, and certainly want to make opposing defensive coordinators sweat a little week in and week out. All right. Tanner chimes in loyal follower here. Tanner, appreciate that. Hey, Kevin Roosevelt, Nick sign. He did. This has been the first fullback on the roster in how long? How does this affect the offense? What will he bring to the team, and how do you see him being used in 2020? Stay safe. Stay healthy. Thank you for the content. Um, it's been a while, folks. Stanley Havili, USC's finest part of the 2013, I think the 2013 spending spree for Chris Ballard. But again, Stanley was more of an H-back. Stanley weighed 230. That's that's a bigger running back. That that ain't Rosie Nix. Rosie Nix is former former collegiate defensive line. I think he said yesterday in the conference call, he's a a defensive tackle. Had to shed weight to be a fullback. I don't like my fullback shedding weight. Again, how does this affect the offense? What will he bring to the team? You know, all those things. He's got to make the team. And right now, when you look at the numbers, you're probably a number short at running back, and you're probably a number short at tight end. So there's an avenue there, but he's got to prove himself in being a vital component to this offense and then without a doubt help on special teams, which is what he has done a lot throughout his career in Pittsburgh. Now, Pittsburgh signed him to a four-year deal in 2018, and um, they released him this past offseason. He battled a knee injury last year. says he's healthy from that. Uh, They signed Derek Watt. And there are some reports out there, although Rosie really didn't want to answer my question about that, which is fine. Got to ask the question. Um, that Rosie approached the Steelers once they signed Derek Watt and was like, hey, uh, I want to be released. So here he comes. The dude doesn't touch the football. He's got four carries. Four carries in 60 career games. But, you know, we saw in 2018 with Ryan Hewitt as the H-back you know, Hewitt barely touched the ball. He caught the one touchdown, but I don't think he was targeted the whole season. So I just think that it, it adds a lead blocking element. It adds that um, just a different dimension to the run game. And if you're going to be very committed to the rushing attack, okay, here's another resource to throw in there. Now, what I don't love, and I love a fullback because I love a slobber knocker. I just love a, just wear the horse collar, 
look like Tom Lipinski, look like Luke Lawton, look like just a fullback that plays for Navy. That's what I want to see from my fullback. Now, having said all that, I know full well that a fullback is very restricted, and when a fullback comes into the game, you're pretty much tipping your hand. So um, I'll be curious to see how it works out, but I guess those are some of the ways. You know, lead lead blocker. I don't think maybe he's your short yardage guy, but, you know, I thought we were on to Jacoby Brissett QB sneaking it, you know, five to seven plays a game. All right, Wake Spike chimes in. Hi, KB. Do you think the league would limit the number of first-round picks? a team could occur in a single draft as it could affect uh, ratings in several markets. Hmm. Also, what are your top five local beers? Wow. Um, I don't, I've never thought about the league restricting how many first round picks. I mean, what, I mean, how many can you get? You can't tank too much in the NFL. Um, three, four. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't see that local beers. Um, I like this one. I'd say we Mac from sun King. Love going to an Indianapolis Indians game, get a little, get a little Wee Mac action, um, and then uh, Northwest Indiana up in the region was is a Munster, I think it's Munster. Um, Three Floyds love Zombie Dust, love Gumball Head. I miss going to the Tap. I like the Tap, the Brickyard beer there. Um, the um, God, what's the what's the brewery in Speedway? Daredevil. Uh, lift off in in Speedway. I've also been to the one um, up on the north side here in Indianapolis, and then um, and then just an old staple, Upland Bloomington. Got one very close to our house. Uh, Dragonfly. I honestly should walk there today. <clears throat> yeah, at uh 49th. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I feel like we got good local beers, don't we? I'm such a cheerleader for the state of Indiana and the city of Indianapolis. Some people are sick of it. All right, Joe chimes in. Hey, KB, big fan of the podcast. Appreciate that, Joe. Do you think that some teams may trade out of this draft due to the inability to perform medical checks and view workouts? Just an interesting scenario. I wanted to hear your take. Thanks for the entertainment each week. Thank you, Joe, for sending this in and sending in questions pretty much every week. This is a good question. Um, Now, my first initial thought is, well, it's a two-way street. You know, if you're going to trade out of the draft, doesn't every team want to trade out of the draft? If they're skeptical about, you know, medical and, and private workouts and, you know, limited access to the pro days. Um, so I could see some teams, you know, wanting to move back. And, and again, I, I look at the Colts and think to myself, boy, if you want to draft a quarterback in 2021, you've got to amass some draft capital. And you don't have, you know, obviously this time last year, you didn't have the extra second round pick either for 2020, but you don't have that luxury right now. So, um, is that a route that they take? I, I just think in general, you're going to see safer guys go higher. I do, you know, especially if you don't have an offseason program, which, you know, it, you, it's very fluid and we'll see what happens, you know, next week. But I just think, you know, maybe the lack of a medical recheck or two. Um, I, I told the EJ Speed story on last week's podcast. Your area scouts are going to be trusted more than ever. You know, we're talking the guys that have the regions around the United States, and they've done that extensive background on these guys um, from a personality character standpoint. Because they know the strength coach for Arkansas and for UTEP and, you know, for Boise State. And, you know, they can dig a little deeper. And you really, you know, coaches, having coaches at the Senior Bowl and Combine, I mean, we saw some teams not want to bring coordinators or assistants to the combine. <laughs> that turned out to be pretty dumb. Cause that might be the only time that these coaches have got to see prospects and talk to them in, in person. So the Colts, Colts brought them, obviously they're in their own city. Um, so yeah, again, I think in general, just a little bit safer. All right, Dan. Hey, Kevin, love the pod. Different kind of question for you. Do you have a set of rules for buying player jerseys? Or do you get who you like? For me, a Colt must check the following two boxes. Number one, must be a Colt for at least two years. Two, have a future as a Colt. I added these rules to my jersey buying after I got a Trent Richardson jersey. I still wear it sometimes for a laugh at the bar. I love Trent Richardson jerseys. I always wear them. Keep on wearing them. I see. I see. Uh, I saw one in the airport a few years ago. I love it. Keep on wearing the Trent jerseys. 
Help me avoid pulling the trigger on a Jacoby and Ebron jersey most recently. What's your overall take on this? Boy, I'm not the guy to ask. Remember, I think I have my brother. Um, God, it's a second voice crack. These early morning podcasts I struggle with. Um, I had my brother buy me a Brandon Jennings Milwaukee Bucks jersey. What a horrible purchase. That was... Ryan, I apologize. That was just a waste of 60. I probably wore it four times. End up, I think I gave it to Brent Young, my roommate in the villas. And gosh, that was just a. And Brandon Jennings now, what is he playing? China or somewhere? God. I thought he was flashy. Honestly, the best jersey purchase I had was probably Paul George's rookie year. Um, I bought a little Fresno State jersey, had a friend of my mother's who stitches lettering on um, on shirts. She stitched George, and uh, boy, that was a hit. I think Paul George even retweeted it. I mean, this was early Paul George. I mean, we're talking rookie year. I love the Fres- I love the Valley on the Fresno State jersey. So I, I'm a huge jersey person. Uh, boy, it, it's tough in the NFL, though. I mean, you, you just laid it out there. You know, it's... I really think you have to pounce on a rookie contract. And I remember my my former roommate, Cornelius Washington, one of the greater individuals out there. um, I think he was on a Maniac jersey early. And him and I collaborated a little bit. And I said, you got to do it. I said, you got to do it. And um, that's what you got to do. You got to find a rookie, like Corey Willis. You got to find a rookie that showed you a little something. And uh, you got to go with it. You got to trust your gut. I mean, you hope the second contract happens and you go from there. All right. Great, great question there, Dan. Garrett, correct me if I'm wrong, but Watson, I assume that's Deshaun, not Bubba, is a free agent next year, or Tom Watson. Um, Any chance you could see the Colts go after him? I got to imagine he wants out of there, given all the chaos. That being said, he he could get franchise tech. Uh, Yeah, I mean, Houston's not that dumb, right? I mean, come on. Sure, Deshaun Watson, it's the open market. Hell yeah, but. All right, Will, Kevin, if DeAndre Swift is there at 44, we draft best available wideout in 34, and the higher-rated offensive tackles are off the board, do you draft them? My take. Look what Rivers did with Eckler. Swift is a three-down back. Great pass protection. Can run the ball. and can do so much in the passing game, plus low mileage. Due to Georgia sharing the rock, would love to know your thoughts. Boy, Will, you sound like DeAndre Swift's agent. You didn't really mention the injury situation, but um, but yeah, it's you, you are right. I mean, I, I watched DeAndre Swift enough to know that he is a very dynamic runner and is probably the number one runner in this draft, I would think. Um, Clyde Edwards and Jonathan Taylor, probably the other two guys in that mix. Does he get to 44? That would be the first question I have. Um, again, I don't do it. Um, and I saw Jonathan Taylor was uh, 44, I think, in the Pro Football Focus mock draft this week. Again, I- I'm I'm all about trying to solve things that I consider issues. I don't consider running back an issue. Um, you know, would DeAndre Swift come in here and be a great asset? Without a doubt. I'm not saying that at all. But again, I'm solving issues. That, to me, is not an issue. Under your scenario... Wide out, you've taken at 34. The top offensive tackles are gone at 44. What about a quarterback or a tight end? Like, to me, I look at running back right now, and I'm like, because I've just eaten so many desserts during the quarantine, I look at running back for the Colts, I'm like, those are, I see 10 chocolate chip cookies on that plate. Do I need an 11th? Okay, maybe that one has a few more morsels than the other one. Okay, fine, but like, then I look at the, the, the tight end plate, I'm like, oh my gosh, those are two stale, you know, cookies with nuts in them. Kind of my thought. Jabroni, any idea what happened to plans with Ben Banigou playing Sam? What are you watching with the next pick? And Ballard seems so excited about him playing in different spots. Why did that die? And my wife watched that next pick last week, and she uh, she's like, it's kind of like sorority rush. 
which gave me a good laugh. It is kind of funny when you watch them in the in the war rooms breaking down prospects. I mean, it, you know, 20 people in there just ripping, and you have to do it. I'm not, like, faulting it. It's, it's part of the process, but it is just kind of funny to uh, to watch. And you really got to stand up for your for your player or, you know, for the traits or whatnot. Um, yeah, Banigo at Sam. I just think that – I honestly think that you started to feel good about your linebackers, but really from day one, what they wanted to do was not try and overcomplicate things for him. So it was, all right – Let's first put him in the role of just basic defensive end and let them, let, let, then let's try and expand the role. Um, I, it's kind of like Leonard almost. Let's play Will linebacker. Okay, now we're going to blitz a little bit with him. You know, like do some other, like grow it from there. Um, and then once you got into the season, Banigou never really established himself consistently at defensive end. And Okariki came on. EJ Speed had a flash or two. And, you know, Anthony Walker was solid. So you just you feel good about what you have a linebacker. Uh, you know, I was so intrigued by what they were describing with the Banigou role. But I, I sit here right now, and again, we're only a year into it, but I'm unsure about his role moving forward. Like, let's say your starting defensive line on rundowns is Houston, Buckner, Stewart, Autry. Let's say Autry plays end. Then your backup defensive ends would be Kamoko Turi without a doubt. And let's not forget about Al Qadin Muhammad. Um so I think that's something that you've got to look into as well. So, yeah, I'm a little bit unsure of just what exactly it'll look like for, for Banigou. Um, again, still very young. All right, we got about – what do we got? Boy, we got a little bit more than I, than I got to. Oh, we're still under an hour. We're good here. All right, Alec. Hey, Kevin, great pod this week. I have a question about James Morgan from Florida National. He's beginning to rise up draft boards, but watching his tape, I wasn't wowed by him. What are your thoughts on him, and are you afraid of Colts fans being a neighbor with him just because of the last FIU player the Colts drafted was T.Y. Hilton? In 2012, wow, never thought about it like that. Um, no, no, I, I think it'd be hard pressed to find many Colts fans that make that connection or think that that's a reason to to draft them. Um, I think people like the arm. I think it's a big arm, and you know, from what you hear and and, and you know, talk to people, there is an amount of kind of the football IQ. He transferred from Bowling Green and. I think people felt like he handled that situation and just his ability to process maybe is a little bit better than your other big arm quarterbacks. Now the decision-making probably needs some work and sometimes he relies on that arm too much, but you know, Alec, what we have, we have to remember is (laughs) you get after the first round, you're going to nitpick any prospect, especially a quarterback. So if you're drafting James Morgan or Anthony Gordon or, you know, Steven Montez or, you know, Cole McDonald, whoever you're, you're drafting, we are nitpicking. And oh, there's a much better chance that guy's a backup than he is ever a franchise quarterback. But I think those are some of the traits that uh, that people like. Steven, hey, Kevin, uh, I was wondering if there's a chance you think the Colts could bring in Devontae Freeman. To me, it makes complete sense and could get a cheap prove-it deal. But would he want to come to Indy? Well, yeah, I think you just answered it. Would he want to come to Indy? You know, if Jonathan Williams is maybe skeptical about coming back, is Devontae... Because when Marlon Mack is healthy, Marlon Mack gets carries, as he should. The Colts don't really use a third runner. You know, we struggle, um, you know, to have have looked at the situation. I mean, I, I've asked Frank Reich this, this question several times about, you know, how much is it, you know, can Jordan Wilkins get on the field in a consistent role as that third back? Um... You know, it's tough because I actually like Freeman as a player, and he's not crazy, crazy old. But when you get into running back, running back maybe more so than – oh, man, big yawn. I yawn more than anyone. Um, probably because I haven't drank coffee in months. Um, you know, running back, it's weird because – like Jonathan Williams has – no role really on this football team when you're purely healthy. But if Marlon Mack gets hurt, that dude goes from 
not dressing to being a starting running back getting over 20 carries. Hell, he might have gotten over 25 in the game. So you're one injury away from really, really needing Devontae Freeman or DeAndre Swift or whatever. So I can kind of hear people out um, about that. But again, you know, just Freeman, look at the depth chart and how Frank Reich is used running backs um, with Marlon Mack being healthy and, and be a little skeptical. All right, I am the beast. He's got a theory. We got to love theories, folks. Ballard doesn't seem like the type of guy to trade a first rounder, especially 13th overall. But there's nothing normal about this year. Hell, this time that we're in right now. No senior bowl. Well, there was a senior bowl. Um, no meeting the players. Yeah, we're going full speed ahead. It's going to be tough to evaluate because of that. Okay, that's fair. Did Ballard have all that in mind when deciding to take the proven commodity, referring to Buckner, over an even more shot in the dark draft than usual? Do you think he knew the NFL well enough to know sell the draft picks because this thing isn't getting po- this thing isn't getting postponed? No, I don't. I don't. Um, I love theories, but no. I mean, Ballard is talking about this at the Super Bowl and certainly the Combine, and I think it's been a very fluid situation from the NFL. And I think he looked at 13 and was like, I don't love any of the quarterbacks. I don't feel like I can trade up to get any of, any of the quarterbacks, something like that. And again, to force Buckner, just because trading for a defensive tackle with a top 15 pick is extremely rare in the NFL, you got to remember what defensive tackle means to Chris Ballard. That group was terrible in his eyes last season. And you're going to be able to acquire an all-pro at a key position while still getting, you know, improving quarterback in their mind here in 2020 with Phillip Rivers. He's going to do it. And San Francisco is going to do it because they're in a dire cap situation and need draft capital, and it's a really deep position group. So, yeah, I, I don't think it. You know, I don't think COVID had anything to do with it. All right, M1K0, what's the status of Reese Fountain? Does it look like he'll see significant playing time this season? And will he be the only bigger body target for Rivers? I mean, right now he's got to be fourth or fifth on your depth chart. And he is, you know, definitely the bigger body. I mean, I saw him high points of balls last year in camp that he played a little bit bigger than than 6'2". So, again, I'm very intrigued by Fountain. Want to see more. Want to see him healthy. Want to see him in game settings. That's the one thing we haven't seen. You know, Kane, you know, produced even in in, in the preseason. We haven't seen that from Reese, uh, even dating back to his rookie um, preseason in, in in 2018. But yeah, I mean, when you look at the ten receivers on the roster, and you know, five of them haven't caught a ball in the NFL, Reese Fountain's going to be pretty high. But we'll see what happens in the draft. Ian, does Wright change his style to fit with Rivers on offense? No. No, not much to change. They know each other. Listen to last week's pod. We broke that down pretty in-depth. Sporadic regularity. Do the moves from Buckner Rivers Road signify that Ballard and his front office think the team is closer to competing than the indie media seems to think? Do those win-now moves give us any idea about the probability of drafting a quarterback high, second round, when he will have to sit this year? Um, You know, I, I guess... You know, to me, like, okay, Rhodes isn't really so much of a win-now mode. You know, Rivers, yes. But, I mean, you know, you got to be honest about this, too. Like, okay, Buckner, Rivers, Rhodes. Let's say they all play like they did last year. Okay, Buckner, all-pro caliber guy. Rivers, what, 18th-ranked quarterback in the league last year? I don't know. 16th-ranked quarterback in the league last year. Rhodes, one of the worst starting corners in the league last year. Okay, if that happens, this team is not in the playoffs. Like, Point blank. Now, what you're hoping for is a change of environment, a change of scenery, um, switching up some of the roles, what these guys are asked to do. That is where you can tap into this a little bit more. So I don't. I think when you look at the AFC, you know Kansas City and Baltimore, and then I'd throw the Colts into that next group. Buffalo, um, you know, healthy Big Ben. What does that do for Pittsburgh? Um, yeah, I still think Tennessee is right there. You guys have heard me talk about that. Um, we'll see what Tyrod Taylor can do with the uh, with the Chargers. I still think that's a pretty talented football team, um, and they have a high draft pick. We'll obviously see the route that they go there. They probably should go off in the line. But I just and, – and, and as far as did the win-now moves think that um, it should lessen the probability of drafting the quarterback, it, it shouldn't because, again, sustained success. That's what you hear from this franchise. That can't be forgotten. 
in this draft. And to me, that's where quarterback comes into play. All right, Bill, what's the deal with Chad Kelly, the last player taken in the 17 draft? Will the Colts hope he grows up and does it become a Manziel Leaf? Or are they going to use that roster slot on someone without such a troubled past? Does character matter? Decision-making, question mark? Uh, I mean, to some, I think character matters more at that position than others. I think they like Chad Kelly's talent, but I just don't get the impression that that locker room loves him. Which, again, you know, maybe it's hard for a third-string quarterback. I don't know. I feel like you always hear third-string quarterback or backup quarterback's the most loved player. Boy, the, no offseason program would hurt Chad Kelly. Yeah. He needs a full offseason. Get in the building. Get get rapport. Build rapport with that coaching staff. He just has to earn more trust. But I think in an ideal world, if they don't draft a quarterback or don't take one very high, Chad Kelly's competing to, again, be that third QB. Um, Connor already asked a similar one about current roster moves, where the Colts are ranked in, in, in the AFC. Um, he says, I guess this is a good enough roster to get to the Super Bowl. I don't think so. No. Um, again, I think Baltimore and Kansas city are still really good and, and really haven't done a whole lot one way or the other. I guess Clay's Campbell was a move. Kansas city has been really quiet right now. I got questions about the pass catching group and, um, and you got to stay healthy on the offensive line. So, again, the draft can, can change that, but as I, as I just said, the Colts I'd group into kind of that second tier of AFC teams. Matthew, is it a possibility they kept Brissett to groom as our next franchise quarterback? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Boy, some fans are going to – they haven't turned off the podcast already. They're going to turn it off there. Um, <clears throat> you know, Jacoby Brissett's going to have a decision to make next offseason. If, indeed, he you know, stays on the team and all that. Like, he's a free agent. What's he going to do? I could see the Colts wanting to bring him back. As their franchise quarterback, I, oh boy, you would hope not. But I'm just curious what the market is for Brissett. Like, does he get to a point next offseason where he's like, all right, this is the best I can do. They like me. They're going to pay me well as a backup. But they're probably going to draft a quarterback, and that's the future. He, I think he's too much of a competitor. I think he wants to find a place that has a better – starting position, or at least a more open. All right, uh, we got four more here, looks like it. Tim, Rick Venturi stated he isn't high on this quarterback class. Would it make sense to begin drafting, or excuse me, begin gathering draft capital for next year's much better quarterback class and pass on a QB this year? I hear you, Tim. Um, I don't say totally no to it, but, and again, that that will be the plan if you're trading back, but I, I just want someone under contract past 2020. Who's your backup? Throw some darts at the board. That's how I look at it. Alex, two questions. If you were a football player, what jersey number would you want to rock? Also, how shocked would you be if the Colts didn't draft a wideout this year? Um, I, I'd be stunned. Stunned. So stunned. Andrew Luck retirement stunned if they didn't draft a wideout. Uh, if I were a football player, what jersey number would you want? Oh, boy. It all depends on where I'm at. You know, what position group? If I'm in the secondary, I want 21. Boy, this is where I really need Julian Long Arrow. If I'm at linebacker, I want 55. D line, give me 99. Wideout's tough. I've always loved Julio's 11. And probably just because I love Julio, but. <laughs> Um, running back, give me, um, running back number 23. Those are my numbers. All right. From Dara here, planning a trip over from Ireland later on in the year for the Jets game. If the season goes ahead, best watering hole in a rest- restaurant to hit up. The only time I've been in Indy, I went to Kilroy's and the Clotta bar pregame. Oh, I love it. Um, schedule sounds like coming out May 9th. So obviously check that out. Um, oh, you said Jets game, not, not Jags game. They play the Jets at home this year? I have no idea. Um, you know, I, I should be better at this question, but, like, I can't tell you the last time I've gone to a bar before a Colts home game. I, like, got a job to do. I haven't, I've been to every Colts home game in the last 10 years. So, um, yeah, that's, that's tough. Let's say, um, I think Slippery Noodle, right there, very close to the stadium, is probably a good bet. 
that's where we were going to have beers with Bowen. Um, so yeah, that's, that's somewhere I would go. Uh, I, I always like touchdown town. I think it's a great, great environment. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's good weather and, um, something to, uh, to explore, but yeah, you know, I, I would say maybe some people will chime in and I'll give you a few more, but I, those are some of the environments that I'd be, I'd be checking out Georgia street as well. Tyler, is there a need to draft a linebacker late? Seems thin behind behind the starting three. I mean, you only have seven, I want to say, on your roster, seven linebackers. But again, these are all Chris Ballard draft picks that can run and strike and have length. And really, you only play two, maybe three. So, I just think... Uh, I, I, I just don't think you need one, to be honest. Darius Leonard, Anthony Walker, Bobby Okariki. Those are your top three. EJ Speed, Zaire Franklin, Matthew Adams, Sky Moore. Seems good with me. Again, I, it goes back to the whole running back cookie comment. I just, <laughs> I'm solving needs. I, I don't think that's a need. Casey with a K, who has a better statistical season next year? T.Y. or Campbell and Hilton combined? Ooh, that's a good one to end on. Or excuse me, Campbell and Hines combined. I'm gonna go with go with the latter. I'll say Campbell and Hines combined. Yeah, but that that, that that's a good one. That's a good one. All right, everybody, appreciate you chiming in um, to this edition of Kevin's Corner. Like I said, post on the website. A lot of draft content this week. It'll be the same thing next week. We'll hear from Chris Ballard later this week. Beers with Bowen virtual Thursday. 8 o'clock, Joey Molinero and I back. That's YouTube live stream. Check that out. Um, yeah, probably next Tuesday, last last podcast for the draft. And I, I'm planning to do a pod like we did last year after round one. So I'll, I'll stay up late and um, get that out to you. You know, it'll be a quick pod. Even if the Colts don't do anything, I'll still know who's on the board there at 34 and 44 for the Colts. So um, we'll have two next week. You know, that, that Tuesday pod, that Thursday pod as well, late Thursday night, probably Friday morning. And then uh, we'll, we'll come back kind of early, early that next week, you know, Monday or something, and, and recap the draft for the Colts. Next week's podcast will be my, my final mock, go over some last-minute um, ones from around the league and just players that I like here in 2020. Everyone stay safe out there. Um, hope you are healthy. Shout out to the greatest family in the world, the Kennedy family. Thinking about them right now. Um, love you guys and love love Elvis. And um, you guys you guys are absolutely awesome. So um, thank you, everyone, for listening to this edition of Kevin's Corner. Again, Virtual Beers with Bowen, Thursday at 8. KBowen1070 on Twitter with any questions. See you. This has been Kevin Bowen. Thank you for listening to another edition of Kevin's Corner. If you haven't already, subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher for the best Colts and Pacers coverage.